Hello guys. Oh buddy, I hope you guys are having a beautiful day. I'm having a wonderful day here in Alabama. Guys, I'm going to do part two of the video on vegetarianism. Uh, I wish we could get this information out to the world, friends, because I'm going to give some information today that I don't think has been put out there anywhere else. As far as I know, no one else has even talked about this. I think it's because, you know, there are a lot of vegetarian uh, promoters, uh, people that believe in this, and of course they've probably uh, given their spiel and, and, and done a pretty good job at helping the world understand this. But at the same time, there's so many lies and things in the world that Sometimes they beat us down. Let me give you an example. I just watched the big fight. I was telling you guys the other day, uh, the, the fight between Anthony Joshua and Alexander Usyk. And of course, I was rooting for Joshua. And I think he's a wonderful guy and just, just, just an amazing person. And I think he's an amazing boxer. And of course, this is true of just about every boxing match you'll find. But I knew because the other guy, Usyk, was from the Ukraine and the political, you know, world right now is just going to be promoting that whole Ukrainian situation. And I knew that was going on. And yet my mind was saying, no, no way. I thought maybe they'd let Joshua win because that would make a better fight with Fury, Tyson Fury, and they'd make more money. And then maybe they were more, because usually they're just interested in money. So I thought, yeah, they'll probably have a give him a fair chance, you know. Maybe they want him to win. Inside, I knew that probably wouldn't, you know. Right now, they don't care if they destroy the whole world to bring in the one world government. They don't care if they lose all the money and and because they're going to have a reset. They don't care about really about money at this point. They really use use the money just to get where they're going. Their goal is world dominance. So, you know, I knew better. But anyway, watch the whole fight. Now, guarantee. If you were to turn the sound off so you don't hear the announcer going, Oh my goodness, Usyk is amazing. Oh, look at how well Usyk fights. Oh, he's just, he's God. I mean, you, 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 after 12 rounds of listening to everybody, the, all the accolades and the other boxers, they have him filing up, you know, Oh yeah, I think Joshua didn't fight very well and Usyk beat him. And they all give their, their opinions and only a very few will come on there and you can see a look in their eye like, darn it, you people are, you know, you're lying. Of course Joshua won. We know that. But they didn't say that because if they want a job, they don't say nothing. I saw Derek Jasora. They interviewed him about it and he's just like, yeah, whatever. He didn't even want to talk about it because he knew that if he said, look, this whole thing was a hoax, that he, he would never have another fight. They'll lose all their money and everything. So they have to keep, they have to bite their lip. But guys, if you watch that fight, 12 rounds, and turn the announcer off. Turn the sound off. Just watch with your own eyes. Joshua rocked Usyk so many times. Usyk never rocked Joshua. Um, that went 12 rounds. In my opinion, Joshua won at least probably 9 of the 10 rounds. And yet they gave it to Usyk. Now, why I'm mentioning that is because some of you will probably say, What? Usyk clearly won, Dave. That's because you were persuaded to believe that. Even if you, you wanted Joshua to win, they're going to persuade you by the chatter, by the, the you know, um, the buildup of their, you know, lies. You just, you're overwhelmed by all of the lies to the point where you're, you just, you give up and and you just go ahead and believe what they're telling you. You know, like I always say, a pack of wolves, they'll do anything. But when you get one lone wolf and they're a little scaredy cat. So human beings can be definitely per be persuaded with, with lots of voices. And, and if they say a lot of lies and they keep saying them over again. But it's the same thing with health. And they actually had me convinced for a while that there were certain nutrients that you could not get unless you ate animal flesh. And I said, well, I, I tried to figure a way around it. And one thing I had determined, well, at least you could get it in fish. And I do believe that it's okay to eat fish and we ought to eat fish. Jesus gave them fish. And I'll explain that later here in the, 
in the video because just, you know, in a nutshell, I don't believe that, that scripturally a fish is an animal. It's not a mammal. It's not scientifically an animal. But we'll get into that in a little bit. And it's different. It's not, it wasn't made on the sixth day like all the other animals. It was made on the fifth day, just like vegetation was actually made on the fourth day. So, or the third day. So there are different, these are different categories. Fish is not the same as a mammal. Um, and, and I certainly do believe we should eat milk and, and eggs and dairy things. And there's lots of some of these nutrients that they're saying you can't get, you know, because they're always conflating veganism with vegetarianism. I'm not a vegan. I'll never be a vegan because Jesus gave us the perfect food. He says his, his egg from his heavenly father gives us perfect food. So I believe that we're all going to the land of milk and honey. Honey is the fruit of the bee. You know, milk is the fruit of the cattle. And, um, you know, eggs are the fruit of the chicken. And nuts and berries and uh, legumes and things like that. And seeds are the fruit of the trees. So I think it's a natural way that we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live with farms. We're supposed to have our our friends. I mean, if you know, if you if you let the goats live out in the wild, they'll be fine. But the goats like to live in the in a family or relationship with humans. They um, they there are like a dog is the man's best friend. We, we I think we were made to use the world in a certain way, and there's another way we're not supposed to use it, where we actually are abusing the world. When we go and hunt the animals, that's abuse. But when we work with the animals, for instance, our dogs, they can be trained to herd the sheep. Well, what do we want to herd sheep for? Because the sheep produce wool. And I so so what I'm saying is, one other little point here, like, for instance, how about elephants? They got these long tusks with a long nose. Why would they need that in nature? The one thing that they, I mean, yeah, they may use it to fight each other, the, the males, uh, ram each other or whatever but you know rhinos have horns they do gore each other with it but there's a better reason for these anomalies just like the reason that a camel has humps and you can sit in the between the humps and the hump stores water and you can use it to travel for many many miles so why wouldn't we use them we we work with nature they they don't mind carrying us us humans they have a relationship a symbiotic relationship with humans. So the, the elephant uses his tusks to pick up logs. They're strong. They can push over trees. In nature, sometimes we need a caterpillar, a bulldozer, you know, and the Lord has provided all of these things. I don't believe we're abusing the elephants by having the symbiotic relationship with them. They're our friends. They do their thing. We do our thing. Chickens lay eggs. Cows give us milk. And um, they plow our fields. And we're supposed to live in this symbiotic relationship. But... Let me show you how we have been fooled. The, the, the lie has gone forth that if you don't eat flesh, meat, you, there are seven things you cannot get. Now, I don't know if it's only seven, but this is the seven that they usually tend to show you. These seven things they claim you cannot get unless you eat meat. Well, let me show you that they're completely lying to you. And we've been fooled by it. Let me start. I, there's a little article. It says seven nutrients that you can't get from plants. So we'll go down. The first one is B12. All right, let me show you where they're lying here, right here. So B vitamins made in the gut, what I wrote. And this is what it says. B7 is also produced by the intestinal bacteria as free biotin synthesized from the, ah, oh, that's not really what I wanted to see here. All right. Um, trying to find where I had read. I've got a bunch of things uh, pinned here to the top of my screen so I can go back and show you. But I'll just read this. It says, is vitamin B made in the colon? Question. And it says, human feces contain appreciable quantities of vitamin B12 or vitamin B12-like material presumably produced by bacteria in the colon. Oh, presumably. Well, huh, see how they're trying to persuade you that maybe it's not a good source and maybe you just should go ahead and eat flesh anyway. How did the cow get the B12 or the vitamin B or any of these other things? They went and they ate grass. They didn't eat flesh. Cows don't eat flesh. So the cows, where they're getting their B vitamins from the cow, they're extracting it from their liver, from their gut. 
they produced it with the bacteria in their gut, but they ate vegetation. Now, humans can do the same thing, and they actually admit it here, but they don't want to talk about it too much. If your gut is working properly, which most people in this world is not, partly due to the fact that we're not getting the minerals like potassium in our diet, and, you know, but I don't want to talk about that here in this video about how you can repair your gut, but suffice it to say, when you eat the proper way, if you were a vegetation and you weren't poisoning yourself, a, vegeta a vegetarian, I should say, and you weren't poisoning yourself with all of these chips and diet sodas and, you know, all the, down the line, all the poisons, and you were getting the proper fiber and you were getting the sunshine and you were doing all the things you're supposed to do, your gut would be working and it would produce all the B12 and all the other B vitamins and everything else and all these other little nutrients that we're going to talk about. It would produce them fine. Just like that's why they find these vitamins that you supposedly can't get except through meat. They find them in meat because the animals that were getting this from went out and ate grass. All right, let's go further here. That was number one. The next one is two is creatine. So let's look at that one. I'm just going to be brief here because I've got a lot to say in this video about vegetarianism. It says creatine is naturally produced by your body in your kidneys, liver, and pancreas. It's made from three amino acids, glycine, arginine, and methanine. So, well, it says number one, on average, you make one to two grams of creatine per day, which is stored primarily in your skeletal muscles. So anyway, we could go on and on, but enough said. They're lying. You get creatine in your gut. Your gut produces it. You're not supposed to get it in the plants. That's not something you would you you should be doing. Animals don't get it by eating the grass. The cows don't get it that way. They make it in their gut just like you do. Now, you don't have to go and kill a cow and take their creatine. You can make your own. See? So let's go on. The next one is carnosine. Carnosine. All right, let's take a look at that one. Wikipedia, carnosine. Carnosine is a depeptide molecule made up of the amino acid beta alanine and histidine. It is highly concentrated in muscles and brain tissues. It was discovered by a Russian chemist, blah, 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 blah. Um, carnosine is naturally produced by the body in the liver from beta alanine and histidine. Like carnitine, carnosine is composed of the root word carn, meaning flesh, alluding to its prevalence in meat. There are no plant-based sources. Well, of course there aren't. It's not supposed to be, you don't supposed to get it from plant sources. The cows don't get it from plant sources. That's not where it, it, just because there's some word that they've come up with, some bacteria or some thing in your gut that you can't get from plants, that they've tried to persuade us, we've got to have, you know, and we can't get it from plants, but they just don't tell you that you have it in your gut and in your liver. And if you're healthy, you make enough of it. And by the way, if you eat this flesh and it has carnosine in it, you probably couldn't absorb it anyway if your gut's not working. So there's only one way you're going to actually get it by getting your gut healthy. So next one, your number four is vitamin D3. All right. Well, all of you should know that you need sunshine. Now that doesn't come from plants. Right? There's no D3 in the plants. It's coming from the sunshine. And in your gut, let me show you this. It says, vitamin D, their study, vitamin D metabolites and the gut microbiome in older men was published recently in the journal of blah, blah, blah. Let's see, that's not what we want to read. Too uh, complicated there. Uh, Alright, look at this. It seems like it doesn't matter how much vitamin D you get through sunlight or supplementation. Forget supplementation. Nor how much your body can store, Cato said. It matters how well your body is able to metabolize 
that into active vitamin D and maybe that's what clinical trials need to measure in order to get the more accurate picture of the vitamin's role in health. In other words, it doesn't matter. You could eat all the vitamin D in the meat you can, you want. But if your gut's not working, then you're not going to absorb it. And everything they're telling us about these nutrients is a big lie. Number five is a DHA, which is an essential omega-3 fatty acid. All right, got to have animal flesh for that, right? Let's let's see. It says here, DHA is mainly found in seafood, such as fish, shellfish, fish oils. It also occurs in some types of algae. Okay, so you can get it in algae. That's not an animal. But you can also get it in fish, which I believe we are allowed to eat fish. I think that Jesus fed his disciples fish, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But what they're not saying here is the next line. In fact, DHA comprises over 90% of the omega-3 fatty acids in your brain and up to 25% of its total fat content. While it can be synthesized from linolenic acid, ALA, another plant-based omega-3 fatty acid, its process is very inefficient. Oh, so yeah, you can make it from plant fatty acids in your gut, but it's inefficient, see? You've got to supplement it with eating meat. Do you really believe these guys? So far, they've lied to us on every count, and now they're trying to say, well, yeah, 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 you can get it from your diet or from your gut fermentation. But, you know, it's inefficient, so you just should eat meat. Well, I'm not going to read any more of that pack of lies because it's obvious they're trying to obfuscate and they're lying to us. And even if they thought it was true, I'd probably wait uh, with a little for a little more research because I think I'll go ahead and just trust the Lord. Thank you very much. They're telling me the only way I can live in this world is go out and brutally kill and murder another sentient soul, you know, and suck its blood like a vampire and somehow that will give me life and there's no other way I can live. Poppycock. A number six is hemi iron. Now this is another, this is the one that they're going to try and get you on. Like, well, now you can't make hemi iron unless you eat flesh, Dave. There's just no way. You're got to get, you're going to have the wrong kind of iron and in fact, actually, if you really look into it, there are lots of uh, metals and stuff like iron that supposedly you really can't assimilate into your body unless you eat animal flesh. There's different kinds of iron. You can, get, you can eat a rock to try and get your calcium, but your body can't digest it. It's not bioavailable. All right, but is it true that the only way to have bioavailable minerals is through meat? That's a big, fat lie. And I believe that you actually assimilate it better with water because they're very small little pieces that can be absorbed. And I do believe they're bioavailable. Let me show you. It says hemi iron is mostly found in products of animal origin. Mostly? Mostly? Oh, well then we should just mostly be meat eaters, right? And just a little vegetables. Is that what they're saying? And it's the most bioavailable form. Is from meat, see, bioavailable, with absorption rates between 15% and 35%. Well, that doesn't sound very bioavailable, does it? 15%. So the rest of it goes out into the sewer. Hmm. This type of iron is readily absorbed, but only accounts for 5 to 10% in the majority of diets. Non-hemi iron is the most predominant form in the diet. 90 to 95% plant-based iron, guys, but has a bioavailability range of 1 to 10%. Now, I wonder why. And, and if you think about it, if we get 95% of our iron from the vegetables and we're getting 10% bioavailability, that's more than the 35, well, 15 to 35% that is bioavailable from the meat, but only 10% we're able to absorb. Now, pay 
close attention to what we're saying here. The good hemi iron they claim you have to have, um, you're only getting 15 to 35% of that in your diet. And of that 15 to 35%, you only absorb 5 to 10%. So 5 to 10% of the 15 to 35% still puts you below what you would be getting if you just got it from your plants. Because you get 95% from the plants and only absorbing maybe 10% if you're healthy. What is 10% of 95? 10% of 95% is about 10%. But 10% of 35% is only 3.5%. So you're getting way more iron, hemi iron, with your vegetables than you are with your meat. And if your gut was working better, which it would work a lot better if you ate the right foods and lots of vegetables, you'd get way more than just 1 to 10%. You'd probably get, you know, 50% or something. They're admitting that, but they just use a bunch of jargon and you don't notice it. Like the little mesmerist, the little hypnotist, they, they wave a little wand over your eyes and say, you will not understand anything we're saying here. But the other thing that they're not saying is that the only reason why people are only absorbing it one to ten percent i mean the one percent range is probably the starving people in cambodia right but the ten percent is probably a few people i don't know in brazil that eat pretty good but they're not eating very good because they've polluted the markets everywhere around the world they're eating chips and sodas and all these other things and they don't eat fiber and and it's all canned food box food there's no real food in the world so I'm sure we could get that 1% to 10% up to, you know, 50% or 100% or whatever it's supposed to be in nature if we were simply eating right. If we were putting fiber and, you know, eating a healthy diet, I'm sure that we would be able to, to absorb plenty of iron through the vegetable kingdom. Anyway, let's go on here. So that's number six. The last one, number seven, is taurine. A sulfur compound. Taurine is modified amino acid produced in the liver and released by the conjugation to bile acids, bile salts, such as tarocholate in the gut through bile juice. Okay, well that's a little descriptive. I don't know if we needed to know all that. The point is, it's made in the liver, guys. They're lying. Bald face lies, hoaxes, this is a complete lie. Now, if they're trying so hard to lie to you about this, well, I wonder why. Maybe it's because they really just want you to get sick and die. I don't know, just an idea. Anyway, for a lot of you, that's not going to be the important thing or the essential reason why you would want to be a vegetarian, because it's healthy for you. If, for some of you, who believe in Mother Nature, and it just makes sense to you, the whole, whole nature thing, and not hurting animals, that's all that matters, and, and the fact that people are torturing the animals, and the fact that these factories, where they make our meat, and the poultry, and... and the farms, they're literally abusing the animals. And that's the most important thing. And I agree. I think that if the only way you could get meat, and if it was necessary to eat meat, and you had to eat meat in order to live, and the only way you could get meat is by murdering other souls in, in a terrible, uh, awful, torturous way, then I don't think we would even partake of that. But why in the world would our Heavenly Father put us in a world where the only way we could live is to torture other beings? That's, I think, even though some of us don't articulate that, I think that's what we would inside of ourselves feel. That it really wouldn't matter. We're going to trust the Lord. We don't care what science says. We can't believe this concept that we've got to go and murder animals in order to live. And I... I see your point and I agree. But what's interesting is that science has been lying to us and this is what I wanted to tell you to start with. 
But I want to share something else with you. Not only is it scientifically true that a plant-based diet is more healthy for you and that eating meat is physically unhealthy, there may be a lot of other reasons why literally eating an animal, I mean, there may, there's lots of little things inside of the material universe, shall we say. Little various little small particles that we don't even know exist. You mean, we've just discovered things like hormones and, you know, in the last few years, really, really to understand these things. And we find that they're very, very small and they operate on a different level. And we know, and we've known for some time, that beneath the atoms, well, beneath molecules are smaller things called atoms, and beneath that there may be smaller things like photons, and beneath that there's other things. So the universe is infinite, and there's these smaller and smaller and smaller little things, and so there's many things. Most all of the makeup of the material universe you're looking at is not something we can even comprehend. It's it's vast. It's it's it works in a way in which we don't fully understand. So we have to put a lot of this or take a lot of this on some faith, although the Lord hasn't left us with just having to do this thing on faith. Even the scientists are digging into this and finding out that they're just wrong. Their model of everything was wrong. But I want to share with you scripturally, and this is another thing that some people will, will find to be one of their main reasons why they want to do it because they believe it's scriptural. They, if Jesus told us that we shouldn't hurt the lambs, just think about this. In the Bible, in the New Testament, it says that Jesus is the good shepherd and he feeds his sheep and they know him and they come running and you say, oh yeah, but that's just parables, Dave. He's just talking about people. The sheep there are the, the sheep-like individuals who love him. All right, so that's a parable. Well, let's say I had a parable about uh, alligators and crocodiles and, and dragons and monsters. And I said, oh, the monsters love me. And the crocodiles, they just love me. Well, then I would develop a picture in my mind that wouldn't make any sense. Why would I be saying that the nature of this evil monster loves this caring, loving Lord Jesus Christ, who gives us grace. That would not be a good analogy. So, alligators eat meat. Monsters are under your bed at night and they're trying to come and suck your soul out. We would not use that as an illustration for something higher. What we're trying, what the Bible's trying to teach us is that the Lord loves us, His great love for us. And so we see a picture of Him loving animals, caring for the sheep. And we say, oh, that's his nature. He loves animals. So obviously he would love humans and, and people that are innocent and, and don't know what to do. They're helpless, like little animals, and he still loves them. But that analogy would have no force if, in fact, Jesus went around murdering animals. If his nature was really just, yeah, he, he likes people. Come on, okay. But... He really doesn't like sheep in the, in the same way that, that we're being told. He really did eat sheep. Yeah, he, 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 he took the axe and he laid that sheep out over on the, on the post and whacked his head right... Yeah, we don't say anymore. That would not be a good picture in our mind of our Lord. Why? Because we know that he's love. And we know that we want to be like him. So if the Bible is using this illustration all the way through, the lamb will lie with the... With the, uh, the lamb shall lie down with the wolf and the... You know, all of this imagery, it would not work if it's all false to start with. If the analogy is not true, then what you're trying to depict in your analogy, the ultimate reality cannot be true. If it's not true that, that the world we live in and the animals can't live in harmony with each other and man can't live in harmony with the animals, then... If that's not true, then why would we think that somewhere in eternity we're all going to have some kind of beautiful harmony? The parables of the Bible, then, about Jesus being a shepherd, and the book of Ezekiel and the book of Jeremiah, talking about this new covenant that's coming upon the earth. It's coming someday. It tells us in the Bible. 
A covenant that we have not yet received because Jesus gave us a covenant. It was called a new covenant and he made it with his disciples. He says, I make with you a kingdom, a, pro, a, a covenant for a kingdom that you will sit upon thrones with me. However, Jesus did not make that covenant with the rest of mankind and with the animals. He will. It is prophesied that he will. But he didn't officially do it when he was here the first time because the Bible says when he returns, he's going to make a new covenant again with all of the animals and the lion shall eat straw like the bull. There will not be this ravenous, carnivorous attitude in nature. And so we know that ultimately we're going to live in a paradise. And we know that we came from, in Genesis chapter 1, a paradise that was not this garden this illusionary garden that Yahweh made with a hedge about it and, and slavery and, and tilling the soil and all this work. But the original paradise that the Apostle Paul went, the third heaven, is the one that El Elohim created in the beginning in Genesis 1 where we ate the fruit. And, and trust me, it's not that he just not got around to telling us, oh yeah, I, I told you in Genesis 1 you could eat the fruit. But I wasn't, you know, I wasn't very explicit. But yeah, of course you could eat the meat too. Well, that doesn't make sense because if we were given meat to eat, that means we'd have to kill. And that means we'd die. And we just showed in Genesis chapter 9 that even after the flood, the Lord El, our Father in heaven, said that just as he gave us the herbs to eat, now... It has been given into your hand by Yahweh through your violence and because you accepted his covenant, because you were deceived and you believed that you had to die. You, you went through the experience of death in order that you might open your eyes and see the Christ within and learn by the things in which you suffered. Like the Apostle Paul says, that which is made alive is not made alive unless first it dies. So we are going to achieve the knowledge of God through death. We're going to find out that the sweet is so sweet because we've partaken of the bitter. But you see, in our Heavenly Father's scheme of things, in His plan, His purpose, His grand purpose, He never allowed us to suffer in reality or the animals to be murdered in reality. This little world we're living in is all an illusion it's temporary. The ultimate, eternal, infinite universe has no death, there is no pain, and there is no suffering. That's where we live in the now. When we learn to focus our will and overcome our doubts and fears, we will manifest that beautiful, precious, eternal, infinite world where the lion eats straw like the bull and the wolf and the lamb lie down together, then we'll have it because we have become like God, knowing the difference within ourselves of good and evil. And we will choose the good and reject the evil. And so this entire situation that we're in is not the preferred method. It is simply a temporary method. We were once infinite, abiding in his love, never dying, in harmony with all of nature, and we're going back to that again. This entire period that we live in today, then, is an illusion. And it may seem that the only way you can get through this world is to murder and kill and hate. But that is the delusion we have to overcome. We actually don't have to do that. Once we lay down our weapons, once we begin to put our hand out, to our enemy and tell him we love him, he will put his hand back out in return and we will find the kingdom of the Lord within because the kingdom of our divine father is within us. And we must pray as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, thy will be done on earth in this world, this temporary illusion that we're in. May it be the Lord's will that is being done right now in heaven. May it manifest on the earth right now. We don't have to wait. We can do it now. We can start living these principles now. Jesus told us, may thy kingdom come. 
May it, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven is the higher thoughts, the conscious, super conscious mind, the love. And that's happening right now in heaven. But in this material realm, it's not yet manifesting because we must choose because we are the feet of the Lord. We are the mouth of the Lord. We are his instruments, his vehicle to spread his love everywhere. And we have to understand the truth and not be mesmerized by these lies. But what I want to talk about now for the last half of this video is people have these concerns about fish because we find that there is no record of Jesus eating lamb or beef or any other thing. That thing that Jesus did with his disciples called the Last Supper, many people like Jehovah's Witnesses and others think that was Passover. And on Passover you would have a lamb. But since the Bible doesn't mention a lamb, they just assume that there was a lamb and that was Passover. Well, as we've said before, that was not the Passover meal. Because Jesus was the Passover. And the night that Jesus was murdered and brutally killed and hung upon that cross was the day of Passover. And he fulfilled it. And it tells us that in Corinthians. The Apostle Paul says, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Let us go forward to the festival of unleavened bread. And so Passover's first, then you go through seven days of unleavened bread, and there's you count full seven weeks or 49 days in the 50th day with Pentecost, and they rejoiced. So you see, the trouble of this world, the death that we've gone through, the unleavened bitter herbs, that's a symbol. And Jesus himself fulfilled it. We are all fulfilling. We're all living through the winter of this dark night. And we're all dying. But we're going to, at the end, at the 7 times 7, at the Jubilee, at the 50th day, we're going to achieve the awakening. We're going to rejoice and we're going to have a great harvest. Not We're not going to eat meat, but it's the harvest of all the grains and all of the fruits. And it's a time of rejoicing. And that's what we're going to get to. But Jesus did not partake of the Passover himself. Not anywhere in the scriptures because the the apostles say that the night that Jesus had his meal, the evening meal that he had with his disciples, was not the Passover. It says it was the preparation. The preparation is the day before the Passover. And this is why the Bible always says it's the Last Supper. And then after he passes away, three days later, he comes out of the tomb and he has another meal with him. And then the Bible says in the book of Acts and the book of Matthew and Luke, it says every eighth day, it's funny it doesn't say every seven because you could say it either way and it would make sense. But on the eighth day, he would come back and have another meal with him. In other words, Sunday. Yes, Jesus had the meals every eighth day until Pentecost with him. Look it up in the book of Acts and Matthew and Luke and you'll see in the book of John. Put those verses together and compare them. And so what it's saying by the eighth day is Sunday. See, because the, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Judeans. And it says in the Gospels, in the Greek, literally, Sabbaton, meaning the, it uses the word after the Sabbaton. The day after the Sabbaton, early in the morning, Jesus was raised up. That was the day after the Sabbath, which is Sunday. And then it describes it again, I say elsewhere, I show, that it is the eighth day, and which would be the Sunday. So we, I don't want to get too much in this whole thing about the eighth day and a lot of people who think that the Sabbath is so special. The Sabbath was simply, sim, certainly sanctified and made holy. Thank goodness it was because that's the day we're living in, the day of this dark night, the day of Yahweh who's deceived us all. Even though Yahweh has put us under this curse, our Heavenly Father blessed it in Genesis chapter 3. So, or chapter 2, verse one and two, he blesses the Sabbath. But that's not the only day he blessed. Because the day he blesses that the blessing that is for an infinite joy, when our joy will be made full, is the eighth day, the day of the resurrection. So we have um, a lot of symbolisms going on. And everything is true to 
the reality. The symbols are going to bespeak of true, joyful, amazing things. They're never going to lie. The Bible is perfectly beautiful and harmonizes with all truth. So, did Jesus then eat the lamb? No, he wasn't having the Passover. There's no, absolutely no record of Jesus having lamb. Now, remember, John the Baptist came eating locusts and honey. Again, doesn't mention that he ate any meat. And, in fact, we know beyond a doubt he did not eat any meat. Because Jesus was a Nazarene. He was the Nazarene. And the Apostle Paul, after Christ died, it says he was the leader the ringleader of the Nazarenes, meaning that he went to Antioch up there in Syria where they were first called Christians. And the reason they were called Christians there and not Jerusalem is because Jerusalem was Judaism, the seat of Ju Judaism. But the other priesthood was up in Antioch where the Essenes were, up by Belbek and up by uh, up in Syria, up by Zarephath that we've been talking about, where uh, Elisha went and started the mysteries. So, the other priesthood, the, the widow's son that was raised up by Elisha and then again by Jesus, the widow of Nain. That was the true priesthood. And they did not eat meat and they were Nazarenes. Now the Bible uses different words to explain this, but most people, it's gone right over their head. So, Jesus, it said, was of, was, lived at Nazareth. Uh, he's born in Bethlehem, but he lived at Nazareth. Now, many people say, ah, ha, ha, see, the Bible's a bunch of crap because we've done some archaeological diggings and we've never found a place called Nazareth. It's not mentioned in any ancient books. There's no Nazareth or any town like that. Well, that's because what they don't understand is that word means Nazarene. You know, that's just a different Latinized spelling. So, what is a Nazarene? What, what are they living... At Na why would there be a place called Nazarene or a, a place called Nazareth? It's because it was a community. A community of Christians or Essenes that, that were all Nazarene priests. They may have had an orphanage or whatever. They, you know, they, 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 some of them, like the ones in, in Jerusalem, were called Ebionites and they were, that, that's translated the poor. It just meant that they, had a, a monastery there or a, a, a community where they certainly took vows and were learning and being initiated into these truths. And there were different types of communities. The community called the Nazarene community is where Jesus was raised up. And I believe that that is either very close to Carmel, Mount Carmel, or is and, and prob probably refers to the school of the prophets at Mount Carmel up in Syria. And that's where Jesus was from. And if you look in your Old Testament, you'll find that Nazarenes were not even allowed to touch a dead body, let alone eat it. They were never even allowed to touch a dead body. And so they were, and they had to have their hair long. So by the way, Jesus had long hair because it was he was under a vow to never partake of meat. And you see, it wasn't just about partaking of meat, although that was you know, part of it, obviously. Because meat's not good for you, and it's killing, and it's death. But it was a covenant. See, the old covenant is a covenant of death. Right off from the very beginning, from Genesis, where, where Yahweh deceives Adam and Eve and gets them to believe they're sinners, right? And condemns them and curses them. The first thing he does is kill an animal and take the hide and say, you've got to be covered. This is atonement. You've got to kill animals and, and, and you know, a life for a life. So the only way you're going to have any life is to murder and you can have the life that I provide. I'm Yahweh. What kind of life does he provide? Well, temporary life. An eye for an eye. A de you know, a, a, a foot for a foot and an eye for an eye. So, since you're all sinners and you're all dying because you murdered, see, you kill an animal, now you got to die. So, in order to have any kind of temporary life, you got to kill another animal. But it's not going to be eternal life because the, pen the penalty that L gives us, now... Understand this. Yahweh makes a law and says you got to die and you got to eat animals and you got to make these sacrifices and, and no one eat the flesh and the blood's running down. And, and so we end up dying because he's a cursed God and he curses us and he curses everything and he's, he's full of vengeance and anger and, and judgment. So we die. But El's commandments, which is pure, absolute reality, which is love, 
you know, love says that if you uh, don't dwell in the life, if you don't allow and receive the living love of the Lord and his grand, beautiful, amazing glory, then you're going to be lonely and you're going to be sad if you reject it. So there is that consequence. And you will, if you get apart from the light, apart from the life, you'll die. Jesus told us that. You've got to be in the vine. If you're not in the vine, you're going to die. You're going to wither up and die. It's not like he's angry and mean, but he's trying to warn us that life is the only option. So El's commandments are far greater than Yahweh's. Yahweh's are temporary. They cause us this temporary death. It's only an illusion because our Father wouldn't let it go beyond that. But our Heavenly Father said, listen, if you just come into harmony, once you find yourself, Start loving everyone. You'll live forever. So, so remember, Jesus then was without sin. And I'm not going to try to go deep into why that was true and, you know, and the nature of Jesus and all of that. We've covered a lot of this in other videos. But most of you know, the Bible tells us very clearly that Jesus was without sin. And he had communion with the Lord. And, in fact, when he was baptized, our Heavenly Father, in some manner or method, spoke from the heavens and said, This is my Son. I am pleased with him. I love him. Believe in him. I'm sending him. I'm telling you this guy is in perfect harmony with me in all things. And so... Our Heavenly Father and the Divine Mother bore witness because the dove was there as well. Remember the dove? Well, that's a symbol of the Holy Spirit and Divine Mother was there as well. And they are in perfect bliss and harmony with each other. And they do not sin. And so Jesus, though he was a man, had already overcome because he was, had already been the Divine Being and he emptied himself on purpose and partook of flesh and blood, but he never sinned. So, being in that condition where he had communion with the Heavenly Father, that means he was not deceived. He did not accept the devil's lies. He wasn't under the delusion. He'd already overcome all of that in prior lives. Or anything like that, if he ever needed any of that. Because he did learn by the things in which he suffered. But Jesus had already attained. So, we know that Jesus would never have killed an animal and eaten it. Since we have already gone through that and we know that that's not the purpose for the animals. And since Jesus himself is our creator, along with his, his divine mother and his heavenly father, they created this place and they know what it was for. They're not going to go around murdering animals. Jesus never could not possibly have ever murdered an animal because he was living in harmony with our heavenly father. So there's no record of Jesus killing animals. However, Jesus did give the thousands there that needed, they were hungry, and he gave them fish and bread. And later on, he gave them fish again, and he gave his disciples fish. Now, some might say, well, maybe that symbolic fish represents something. Well, as I've said, parables have to mean something. If the parable itself in its material uh, understanding is not true, then it cannot be a good analogy for something spiritual. And so therefore, if Jesus would give them fish and it represented something spiritual, then the physical part of that parable had to be true as well. So we're looking at the Old Testament and we're seeing Yahweh's telling him to sacrifice animals and the blood's running out and all that's bad. It's an example of evil and vengeful God. But when Jesus comes in the New Covenant, he's burning over a charcoal fire, some fish, roasted fish, and he's giving it to them. And their eyes were open. And they recognized him. So we know that fish cannot be a bad thing. That Jesus would never have, have allowed those verses in the New Covenant, in the, in the Gospels, to be written. That might somehow deceive some poor innocent soul. It might think, well look, Jesus ate fish. He fed fishes to his disciples, told us to eat fish. And they go ahead and eat fish. Now if that was wrong, then Jesus would be responsible for that. So therefore, fish is edible for humans. And so some of you say, well, now, you're just being, you're trying to split hairs. You know, fish are animals too, Dave. Look at their little eyeballs, and they feel pain and all this. Look, that may be true. When you poke them, they 
they're they have nerves and it and and they run away and 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 whether they feel the pain any emotional uh sorrow or anything like that i doubt it but i'll tell you if you there are plants that when you touch them they close there are plants that eat bugs and stuff like this but they're not souls okay they don't have any feelings we can eat plants even though they have a type of blood some of them like a sap yeah they were made on the third day and so they're, they're not the same kind of thing as stuff that was made on the sixth day. They were animals that have, they have nurture their young and suckle their young and they have warm blood and they have a heart and they have a soul. The Bible says they're living souls. And there are living souls in the water. Those are dolphins and whales. But the fish are a lower, or, are a lower order of being. They were not made on the, on the sixth day as the other animals. They don't have souls. And, I'm not just saying that. It's not my interpretation. Judeans teach that. The law of Moses teaches that, that because of the law that says a life for a life, that in, because you, uh, your life should be taken so you can offer a sheep instead, that life for a life, a soul for a soul. Well, they couldn't offer fish because the fish isn't a soul. So Judaism does not accept, the law of Yahweh does not believe that fish are souls and therefore they don't have consciousness and they don't feel that kind of pain now i know some people may say well I, I feel sorry for them anyway that's up to you you could do that if you want but i don't feel sorry for the grain and the and the vegetation that i eat and that's just something that we should do jesus didn't do that he ate bread and jesus ate fish and fish are just not souls the, the catholic church does the same thing on a good friday or whatever they don't eat meat so they'll eat fish that's why we have clam chowder because there's a jewish law that says you can't you shouldn't boil a goat in its mother's milk a baby goat uh so because of that law they put fish in the soup that has milk they, they boil it in milk and they'll serve clam chowder instead of stew on this particular day when they're not allowed to eat meat because the Catholic Church and Judaism, all religions, agree that fish were never souls and don't feel pain and it's alright to eat them. Another point that I want to make is that in the book of Ezekiel, it tells us very specifically that during the millennium or a certain period of time that's coming for the earth, when the Lord's kingdom will be set up upon the earth, the lamb shall lie down with the wolf and the lion will eat straw like the bull. And yet it says that there will there will be the river that will be cleansed and it will be fresh water and there will be certain seas that had salt in it that will be cleansed and there'll be fishermen and they'll bring up the fish and they'll eat these fish and they'll and there will be 12 trees of life and 12 fruits that grow on the 12 trees and the people that are living in paradise including the animals who will not be eating each other will be eating the fish and drinking the eternal water and eating from the fruit that will now be, uh, the, the curse will be lifted from the earth that Yahweh put upon it. But we will be eating fish during the millennium. Now, whether or not we will eventually evolve to a place where we won't eat fish is up, I don't know. I think that's very possible. We might advance to a place someday where we will just receive uh, energy right straight from telepathic means or whatever. But as we exist in this physical body, and during the millennial, we won't have bodies of light yet, but we will be, our bodies will be alive, those who have immortality. And so we won't have, the Bible says, we won't have blood in our veins. We don't know exactly what it'll be because it says we don't know what we shall be, but when we see him, we will be like him. And Jesus, when he was raised up, said, look, touch me. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see that I do. And that's the only place in the Bible where that expression is used, flesh and bones. Everywhere else is flesh and blood. So I, it, that is telling you that Jesus didn't have blood because he poured out his blood. He passed over from death to life. He's now immortal and he never dies again. And we will be like that. We won't have blood as we have it now. We'll have spirit in our veins. But we will have a corporal body of some kind, a physical body that will never die. And so we will eat the fruit 
of the trees and all of the in environment around us will be in harmony and will never die. But there will be more advancements in the future, in the thousands and millions of years to come, and where we'll eventually, you know, be and what we'll look like then, we don't know. But during the millennial, for another thousand years, human beings will be allowed to eat fish. There is nothing immoral about eating fish. If it makes you feel bad when you hook a, uh, a fish with a hook and you feel like they're, they're, they're feeling that pain, you know, I agree. I understand that might not be the, the best way to do it. How do we know that they don't feel some kind of pain? Those are questions we don't know. However, we do know they're not conscious. They're not conscious of eternal life. They don't reason things out. They don't have emotions like we do. So if they do have any kind of pain, it's probably just chemical reactions or something. They're probably not really feeling it. But still, it makes us feel bad when we, when we hurt the fish. And I don't, I don't advocate hurting fish. Maybe if you go fishing, it, it would be a better way to fish if we caught them in nets and so forth. I don't know. But I, and I, I know I hear a lot of you saying, well, they're going to die anyway. They're going to suffer. They're going to suffocate. Okay. So I know there are people that will knock them in the head real quick and put them out of their misery. Look, I understand that some of you think, well, I won't do that. I'm sorry. Fine. But your morality is higher than that of the Lord, if that's the way you feel. And that's, that's your choice. And maybe you could get all the nutrients you needed from eggs and milk, but then some of you won't even eat eggs and milk. And as I've said, we ought to eat eggs and milk because all these, you know, I, look, I understand that today the dairies are not milking the cows properly and they're all suffering and we shouldn't drink that milk. And it's pasteurized and homogenized and all that. I agree with that. We should get our own goat and milk it ourselves in a, in a way that's friendly and, and doesn't hurt the goat, and we provide for the goat, and we, the goat's our friend, you know, and, and we have a symbiotic relationship with our animals, and, the, and you know, the dogs go out with us and herd the sheep. They love it. And we take the sheep, and we, we, we take the wool. The sheep don't mind. They need that hair to be harvested. They, they, they get hot in the summer. So, listen, what I'm saying is it all works out beautifully and in harmony with the truth. And so this idea that Jesus ate fish all the way, it's not just in the New Testament, it's all even in the Old Testament. We're going to be allowed to eat fish, even though at some point when we're immortal, we're not going to be eating animals. And that's a biblical and that is scriptural and that is what the Bible teaches. But there's one more thing I want to cover before we go, because we're almost up to an hour now. And that is the Apostle Paul's words about, I think twice he mentions meat eating and it seems that he's saying it's all right to eat meat. I think because we're getting so close to an hour, I'll probably discuss this more in depth in another video. And um, I think it'll become clear what the Apostle Paul was talking about. We have to understand that there are two things that the Apostle Paul was addressing. One was the offering of meat to an idol. And the Apostle Paul was saying, if you go to the market and there are people who are saying to you, hey, does this meat that's being sold in the market was the remains, the leftovers from meat that's been sacrificed to, to deities, to idols, and, and perhaps even to um, um, Yahweh. And remember what we read the other day in Acts chapter 15, where the disciples and the apostles and the elders and everything came together and decided that we have to abstain and not partake of any of these things that are polluted, meats that are polluted because, in other words, what do you mean polluted? In other words, they, they would have been fine, but they were offered up to idols. So, when Paul says it's alright to eat it, he's not saying it's okay to eat meat. He's saying the food that is polluted because it's offered to a, an idol it means nothing to us. We, we don't have any intention of offering food to an idol. So if, if we eat something that someone else had already dedicated to a false deity and we didn't know about it, the Apostle Paul says it's up to our own conscience. We're doing it in faith. It's not a sin. So now that's part of what Paul was talking about. He wasn't advocating meat eating in, 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 in what he was saying there. He was just simply saying, if you have faith 
and you're eating something and somebody comes along and says, oh, hey, that was offered to an idol. It's not like, oh, you committed some terrible sin. You didn't know. means nothing to you. Idols are nothing. You know, you didn't do it intentionally, so it didn't mean anything. Now, there are two places that we said that the Apostle Paul is, seems to be talking about eating meat. In 1 Corinthians, and I showed a, a little bit there of that verse, it's a little easier for you to probably gather that he's just talking about eating things that might be sacrificed to an idol. But then you still have to ask yourself, why is he saying that if you had faith and you're in a market and you're eating and you see some meat, don't worry if it's been sacrificed to some false deity. That's none of your business. Just, you know, you can still eat it if you have faith. Okay, fine. You have faith because you know you're not sacrificing it to a deity. But here's the problem. Why didn't the Apostle Paul say, yeah, it'd be better not to eat the meat anyway? You know, forget whether it's been sacrificed to an idol. We don't eat meat no more, right? Didn't they say that in Acts chapter 15? Don't eat things strangled. That would be meat. Or any meat that you've, you know, spilled its blood. Don't eat meat, right? Well, perhaps that is what he's saying. Look at Romans 14. This is the other place where he, he seems to be talking about this subject. And look at verse 21. It says, It is good neither to eat meat, and that word is crea, which is flesh. Well, that's where we get that word creatine, right? We were talking about, well, it's better to not eat flesh, well, it's actually good to not eat flesh, nor to drink wine. It's not good for you, physically. Nor anything in which your brother stumbles or is led into sin. Oh! So eating meat or drinking wine could lead your brother into sin. So, I'm not sure what the Apostle Paul had in mind when he was explaining all of this. But it also says that you eating meat or drinking wine could lead you to sin or to sickness, to become ill. When you eat meat, you could get sick. It might not be good for you. And wine, you know, people drink wine on occasions, sacraments and so forth. But evidently, you know, when Jesus took that vow as a Nazarene, they weren't allowed to eat meat or drink wine. So that's a whole other subject we've probably got to get into. I don't think the Apostle Paul is saying, yeah, we ought to drink meat or ought to drink wine and eat meat. He's saying, look, I would rather never do it again because it might stumble my brother and, and they might go out and start eating meat and drinking wine. And you say, well, well, and that wouldn't be good, right? Well, why is he saying if you had faith, you could do it? Well, he's just saying, look, some of you are saying you have so much faith, you could do anything. Like, you know, in, in uh, what is it, in the book of Mark, it says that if, if they're Christians and they have faith, they could pick up serpents and it wouldn't harm them or drink anything poison, it wouldn't harm them. Yeah, if you had faith, you could drink poison, it wouldn't hurt you. But Paul is probably saying here that, yeah, okay, fine. If you have that much faith, that's wonderful. Have that faith between you and God. But you go around drinking poison and you might... The children might see you doing that and think, oh, well, we should drink poison. Look, there, all things are possible with the Lord. Anything. You could drink poison. You could eat meat all your life and be fine, maybe. Who knows, right? Because if you had that much faith, you would just assume that everything you do in this world is just an illusion and it doesn't matter anyway. If, if, if they got you down on an operating table and they strapped you down and they they funneled wine and meat and every other vile thing into your body. That's why Jesus said, it doesn't matter what goes into your mouth, but what comes out of the heart. In other words, we shouldn't, you know, put bad poisons in our, in our body, but that's not the worst thing that could happen. The worst thing is that you, you, you allow your heart to be defiled. See? So if you eat some poison accidentally or because you think you've got so much faith, you could do anything and you can handle serpents and you can do anything that might lead your brother to sin, or even yourself, if you didn't have that much faith. He says, you know what, even though you've got all that faith, don't do it. Paul is really saying, don't do it. Because if you really read what he's saying, he says, it's good 
neither to eat meat nor to drink wine for anything or anything else. Pick up serpents, drink wine, eat meat, eat poison, whatever. You know, all that that you think you've got so much faith you can do it. But he says, you know what? That doesn't mean we're supposed to do it on purpose. You may have faith that you think you could survive it, but don't do it on purpose. So that could be what Paul's saying. Look, we don't really know what Paul may have had in mind here, but what we do know is the Apostle Paul with Peter, James, and John all were there in Jerusalem, and they came together to see about these things, and they concluded that we should abstain from animals that have been strangled or animals that have been bled. Uh, you know, abstain from that because it's killing and we shouldn't kill. But there are other things that we'll discuss uh, about that probably in another video because we're over an hour now and I want to give it justice if we discuss this. So we'll do that in another video soon. I'm going to go ahead and go, guys. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is David Vos and may the Lord bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.